This is the Nuance Podcast by Medicine Explained. We're your hosts, Amanda and Dan. We talk to experts on health, the human experience, and the intersection of climate and human health. We explore the nuance that's been lost in today's conversation. We don't take ads because we want to keep our information unbiased. But we do need your support. So leave a review on Apple or Spotify. And share with your friends or on social media. In today's conversation, we speak with Dr. Scott Stoll, who is the co-founder of The Plantrician Project, the International Journal of Disease Reversal and Prevention, and the Regenerative Health Institute, a unique collaborative project with the Rodale Institute that integrates a regenerative vision for human health, agriculture, and the environment. He is a member of the Google Food Lab, serves on the advisory board at Whole Foods for their healthcare clinics, and served as a member of the Whole Foods Scientific and Medical Advisory Board. Every year, Dr. Stoll hosts the very popular One Week Health Immersion, Dr. Stoll's Total Health Immersion, and helps attendees restore and optimize their health, overcome addictions, and develop a sustainable regenerative lifestyle. Dr. Stoll has authored several books, scientific articles, and has been featured in numerous documentaries. He was also a member of the 1994 Olympic bobsled team. Today, we talk about the pillars of lifestyle medicine that make up health, including stress, sleep, diet, and activity. We chat about the root cause of disease and how we can prevent and reverse chronic diseases. We also talk about regenerative agriculture and why it is so important to reconnect with our food and our environment. And the underlying theme throughout this podcast is hope. I really enjoyed this conversation and I hope you do as well. Now onto the podcast. Hi, Dr. Stoll. Welcome to the podcast. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Um, We did an introduction call and I love everything that you've been working on. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Yeah, likewise, Amanda. I am so excited to be here and uh, I just really want to honor your amazing work with um, the podcast that you've done and all of your work on social media to help enlighten and educate and inspire people around the world, really, in in such a short period of time. You're doing an amazing job actually doing this in a residency, too. So I'm I'm so glad to be here. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much. Um, That's really kind. So I really just want to jump into your story. Um, You're a traditionally trained physician. So how did you get involved in nutrition and lifestyle medicine? Yeah, you know, I was trained as a interventional physiatrist in sports medicine. And, uh, you know, Looking back on our residency training, it was uh, one of the underlying principles was adding life to people's years. And so I think that that was kind of wired into my brain where I was always looking to improve the quality of life for people despite the conditions that they were facing. When I started practicing medicine, I was doing exactly what I was taught to do, procedures, ordering tests, interpreting MRIs, taking care of sports teams. And I kept hearing my patients tell me the same thing, Dr. Stoll, can't you help me? I'm falling apart. And like most doctors, you know, I assumed that this was the inevitable consequence of aging, that this is what happens. You get bad genes, maybe lifestyle factors contribute to this, but we develop diseases as we get older, you know, and it's, I'm there to help minimize some of the suffering and manage the disease. There was a day in my practice, there was a woman sitting on my exam table, and she said the same thing to me. Dr. Stoll, can't you help me? I'm falling apart with a smile. And I'm looking at her chart and past medical history and active conditions, and it's a long list. And so I just I asked her, assuming it was something on the chart, what does falling apart actually mean to you? And I'm anticipating, like so many doctors, right? I'm anticipating, oh, it's this one, or it's that one, or it's a side effect, it's complication, it's pain from her knees or her back, what am I going to do about it? And I had to stop looking at my chart when there was a long pause. And I looked up and tears were running down her cheeks. And she said, my marriage is falling apart because my husband is exhausted from taking care of me. He's got nothing left. We're facing financial bankruptcy because of the cost of healthcare. We fell into the donut hole. She said, I haven't been able to travel and see my grandchildren in more than three years because I can't get on an airplane and fly across the country. I can't go to church or social activities because I have too much pain. I'm depressed, and because I'm depressed, I don't have any more friends. 
And then she said, can you help me? And in that moment, I was not prepared to give her an answer. I thought back on all my reams of pharmacology that I learned in medical school. I thought back through residency and the procedures that I could do. And I realized that I was not trained to actually help somebody reconstruct their life. I didn't know how to add life back to her years. I didn't know where disease came from. I didn't know if it was reversible. I didn't know if I could really improve any of those things that she valued so much that were being undermined and eroded by the diseases on her past medical history list. So I walked out of that room and I said, Scott, what are you going to do to help someone put their life back together again? And that started me on a learning journey that led me into the power of lifestyle medicine and especially the power of whole food plant-based nutrition to not only prevent, suspend, but actually reverse disease. Wow, that's, that's a very impactful story. After you transitioned to lifestyle medicine, what have you found are really some of the root causes of um, people's chronic lists of diseases? Yeah, that's, that's, that is the question, right? In medicine, you know, the mm -hmm. idea of remission of disease uh, is kind of magical or mystical, right? We don't, we, people have remissions and we don't quite know why. Um, recently, you know, the American Diabetic Association came up with the term remission, and we have remission in cancer, but, you know, we don't know necessarily what to do because we don't know where it comes from. And we've become masterful in medicine, looking at the molecular mechanisms of disease and then developing treatments to manage those molecular mechanisms but we've never gone back a step further or two steps further to say, well, why is there disruption? You know, why do people develop atherosclerosis in their arteries? Why do people develop like this progressive insulin resistance? Why do people develop autoimmune diseases? And you know, the kind of pat answer, well, it's genetics. It's, you know, maybe bad lifestyle, it's environmental talk. We, we kind of throw it into a big soup and mix it up and we don't have clarity. And because we don't have clarity, we can't take the active steps necessary to help people reverse disease. So as I started to look at this problem, I just kept asking questions like my children do, you know, when they're like, well, why dad? Why daddy? Why is that? What's next? Why dad? And eventually you get down to places where you're like, I don't know. So I guess I better take a look. And I discovered that, you know, one, it's lifestyle. It's the choices that we make. It's 2,000 pounds of food that we eat every year. It's the stress that we carry in our bodies that activates cortisol that disrupts our microbiome. It's inactivity. It's sleep, which the body sees as stress. And bite by bite, stressful day by stressful day, inactive day by inactive day, disrupted sleep night after night, and the entire like fabric of our bodies, the, the, the systems that are in place to just run and those amazing systems that have resiliency to overcome so much just get worn down. And as they get worn down, we get cellular disruption, we get inflammation, and we get uh, accumulated injury. I always like to think about accumulated injury like accumulating credit card debt. You know, it's one swipe of the credit card at a time, 20 bucks here, 20 bucks there. And then you get your statement, and you're like, $2,500, where did that come from? And it was really one swipe at a time, one decision at a time, the same thing in our bodies. We accumulate injury over time, inflammatory injury, endothelial cell injury, the cells inside of our blood vessels. We're packing fat and disrupting um, insulin signaling in our muscles and our liver. We're disrupting our immune system, leading to the susceptibility for cancer. We're disrupting our microbiome because of stress and food, uh, leading to, you know, um, uh, leaky gut and autoimmune diseases. You know, it's all of these core systems that get disrupted and have redundancy woven into the system. And this is the deceptive part because we can make bad choices for so long and not recognize that our bad choices are harmful because the body has redundancy. But eventually we use up the reserves and disease begins to manifest slowly at first, little ache, little pain, little bit of inflammation, little bit of fatigue, more frequent illnesses, and eventually it manifests in a major disease. And we don't recognize that it was 10, 15, 20 years 
of choices that led to the diseases. And the last thing I'll just add into our conversation, yes, it's lifestyle choices, but if we go even a step further to say what's the origin of lifestyle choices, it's our culture. Our culture made a radical shift beginning in the Industrial Revolution and every war since then has shifted us in the direction of unhealthy lifestyle choices. And now we have this milieu in our culture of the world that just facilitates and enables poor choices. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Thank you for explaining that because a lot of times when you're in the clinic, especially when you're um, working with like underserved populations and you know a lot of their disease processes come from what we call lifestyle factors, but it's not necessarily like their choice. And it's really hard for them to create change uh, when they have so many other fires to put out in their lives, like lifestyle choices, like better nutrition, getting better sleep. Like what if they have like to work two jobs to pay the bills? So it really is like a cultural factor that plays into the lifestyle choices that we make. And so can you talk a little bit about what some of the main cultural factors are that are facilitating this? Like what are some of the root causes of like structural issues that lead to disease processes? Yeah, and this is such an important point uh, that you're making because it's very easy to slip into the judgment of people with lifestyle choices and say, well, they don't have enough willpower. You know, that I don't know what's wrong with them. They don't believe in themselves. They are, you know, we just start. It's very easy as clinicians to just assume that somebody's not making good choices because they don't want to, they don't have enough strength, they don't have enough willpower, they're not applying themselves. And that's the wrong way to approach it because, like you said, it's the system around the person that either empowers good decisions or enables and facilitates, like greases the skids for bad decisions. We have like systems in place. Um, if we look at our inner cities, where they have very little access to healthy food. They have very uh, little social support, you know, a social network that supports and encourages them, that empowers them, that speaks life into them on a daily basis. They have limited financial resources and healthy options, access to gyms, access to healthy food can be very expensive. And they may not have those financial resources. They have uh, infrastructure around them that, that does not support a healthy lifestyle. Living in an apartment building with streets and sidewalks and limited access to parks is not a healthy environment. We have political systems that are not supportive of making those lasting changes. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a social uh, political mess that has created these, these challenges for people. We also have a food system that is exploiting people for their money and knows that it's exploiting people for their money because they understand that they are um, they are hacking into our reward systems through sugar, fat, and salt and using that to create food dependency to extract money from people. They know it. They hire scientists to do this. It's well documented. And so we have an entire food system that is profiting financially on unhealthy choices. And so it's, it, you know, when you start adding these things up, it can seem pretty daunting uh, that the system is against us. But what I find so empowering is that when you look at small communities of people that decide they want to do something differently, that they're going to support and encourage each other, find accountability, those groups of people can see radical changes. You know, I know this, I've worked with healthcare systems like Midland Health in Texas, where, you know, we started with one CME event and now there's lifestyle medicine centers in the hospital, there's curriculum in the schools, there's community gardens, there's large conferences. I mean, there's so many things have happened in this community because they gather together to pool resources and support and bring about change. So that's the hope is that by coalescing and finding these communities that are empowering individuals and supporting them, you know, at the grassroots level, we can build our way out of the current problem uh, rather than trying to tackle it from the top. Wow. Thank you. Um, that's very well said. And you, you mentioned the food system. So um, I know that you're very much a supporter of regenerative organic agriculture, which is 
rare to find physicians um, who are interested also in agriculture. Um, so how did you stumble across this? Can you talk a little bit more about the food system and regenerative organic agriculture and why it's so important to, to support that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's the same process of asking questions, right? You know, you start looking at food, then you start understanding that food has nutrients and that the amount of nutrients that our body absorbs really impact our health. So then you ask, well, where do the nutrients come from? And you understand that the nutrients really come from the soil and the environment where the plant is grown. And then you ask, well, what facilitates the right environment for plants to be healthy? And so as you start working backwards by just asking questions, you end up in this place of regenerative organic agriculture, which is focused on healthy soil. They actually are farmers of soil that happen to grow plants in the process uh, and happen to grow food because they, they realize that it's the, the soil is the foundation of a healthy plant. And so they spend most of their time studying the soil and trying to improve the quality of living soil with billions of organisms inside the soil that become uh, synergistic and symbiotic with the roots of the plant and grow healthy plants. So as I was working through that process, I, I happened to be taking care of the executive director of the Rodale Institute. I was injecting his shoulder with PRP for his rotator cuff. And I said to him one day, I said, you know, I've always wanted to have an education center on a farm to teach people these connections between soil, plants, people, healthy health care, healthy world. And he said, well, let's work together. So we partnered with the uh, Rodale Institute. They've set aside some land on their property to begin building the Regenerative Health Institute, which is a brick and mortar center to um, serve the education, but also like a location that um, it's a North Star for these kinds of conversations between healthcare and agriculture. And we've done a lot of work together in the process, including an upcoming immersion for healthcare providers on the farm. We're gonna teach healthcare providers about soil and soil scientists are gonna learn about healthcare and we're gonna start figuring out ways to work together. Uh, so it's really exciting. And you know, I always go back to, and I always encourage people, one of the most, um, life transformational things you can do is start growing some of your own food. It, it connects you very differently with the process, the sun, the rain, the soil, and it, it moves you into more of a place of gratitude around your food rather than our current food system, which, which focuses you back on self and self-pleasure. So anybody that's listening, I encourage you to just grow something. Grow some basil, grow some parsley, whatever you can grow, just grow something. <laughs> And those can also be done in an apartment complex, too. If you just have a window, you can put it right by the window and, <laughs> and grow some parsley or some basil. I really love that. And I'm so excited about the Regenerative Healthcare Conference. And that that whole vision is, is beautiful. And I think it's very much needed. Um, something that I've been thinking about recently, too, is that we really just need to reconnect with not only each other, because loneliness is such an issue, but reconnect with like the land. And we've become so isolated recently from our land, from each other. And um, if you take a cell in isolation, it's not getting signals from anywhere else. So essentially that can become cancerous and it becomes chaotic. And, and so it's just unhealthy to be disconnected from each other, from the land, from everything else. So I really, really love this, this vision that you have for regenerative healthcare. And then, so what is your, is your long-term vision for this conference and where do you see healthcare going with this regenerative lens? Yeah, so that's, you know, um, I really love it. I just want to echo what you said about disconnection and connection, because it really is, you know, when we look at the core of health, it's all about connections, healthy connections at every single level. And healthy communities are about healthy connections between people and open, healthy lines of communication built around love. And the same with agriculture. You know, if the soil is healthy and the organisms in the soil are healthy, they're connected, they literally become part of the root system of the plant. And so everything about health really comes down to healthy connection and communication. So that's really our vision for the first conference that we started, the International Plant-Based Nutrition Healthcare Conference, was to develop a conference, one, to educate, equip, inspire, and empower healthcare providers, but two, to create an environment for healthy connections. You know, we serve three meals a day, 
and our vision was that people would come have this you know it's a it's one track in the conference it's not multiple tracks because we want people to be together to eat together to fellowship together to communicate to find support collaboration and to grow together um, and so that was that that was our vision for our original conference which has spread to you know conferences around the world and that's our, our vision for the regenerative healthcare conference is to bring together kind of two disparate groups that are not talking all the way up to like the FDA and the, you know, the, um, you know, healthcare groups uh, at the highest levels. They're, they're not USDA, FDA, they're not talking. And doctors and health and uh, agriculture people are not talking and yet we serve food three times a day in our hospital where is it coming from is it supportive of health, human health so we want to create open channels for communication so that healthcare systems like St. Luke's Hospital in uh, Bethlehem Pennsylvania can you know be an example by having a regenerative organic farm on the grounds of the hospital and we work to create um, relationships where the residents and even med students will rotate through for two weeks with the farmer and be on, working on the farm and have land to grow their own food. And so we're creating relationships and connections that did not exist before to begin changing the way people think and to change paradigms and to open up this, this beautiful potential of integrating farmers and healthcare around the world. I love that vision. And it's it's so important because we talk about nutrition and the importance of nutrition when we talk about lifestyle medicine, less so in the traditional medical setting. But a lot of times we have no idea where the food's coming from. And so all of these connections from the soil to our health, to the planetary health is just really important to, to emphasize. And so you, you mentioned the, the one week immersion course that you've um, started and now is a worldwide thing. Can you talk a little bit about what you do during the one week immersion? Do you see people become healthier within just one week and what really inspired that? Yeah, what's so amazing to me, uh, and I think, you know, we've been doing this for more than 10 years now. Um, Every like you can abuse your body for a decade or more, but your body, you know, its natural state is health. And when you support the systems of the body with what it needs, it rebounds to health much more quickly than we would ever imagine. Certainly more, much more quickly than we were ever taught in medical school and residency. So we bring in a hundred unhealthy people. You name the diseases, they're struggling with them. And we feed them a whole food plant-based diet. We do a little bit of exercise because most of these people have not done any exercise in a decade. We teach them how to sleep. We teach them how to manage stress, how to eliminate stress or relieve stress. I don't like stress management because we want to get rid of it. And in one week, we actually have to hire another physician to titrate or de-prescribe medications during that week because people get healthy so quickly. We see things like that still surprise me to this day. You know, somebody with fibromyalgia for 10 years at the end of the week says, I have no more pain. Uh, bone on bone knee pain hasn't walked on the beach in 20 years. And I'm shocked they're walking by me smiling at the end of the week. Consistently, people say because of the reduction of neuroinflammation, I haven't felt this good since I was 18 years old. I have so much mental clarity. Um, anxiety, depression, you know, being reduced dramatically, blood pressure, even, you know, high blood pressures normalizing in just a week. And some of these conditions, you know, depending on the degree of the injury and the duration, you know, we, we make good progress in a week, but it takes more time for the body to heal. But in one week, I think what's astonishing is how quickly we can recover, how resilient the body is and, and how the body can naturally regain its footing when we just feed it what it actually needs, which is all of the nutrients found in plants. That is amazing that you see so much progress within just one week. Um, and that must be, I mean, it's inspiring for me. It's inspiring to all of our listeners. So if you have a few pieces of advice, actionable things that people can do who are listening to um, relieve stress, which seems like a tough ask <laughs> in this environment and improve their diet or their 
inactivity or their sleep, the four pillars you talked about, what are some like really actionable things that people can, can do to help maybe relieve some of these um, chronic diseases or like just ameliorate some of the symptoms? Yeah, you know, the longer I'm doing this, the more I realize that health really begins with a mindset. It begins with what we believe, begins with a seed of hope and some faith in, in, the, in the solution, begins in removing some doubt and unbelief. It begins removing some guilt and shame from dieting that, you know, the diet industry fails so many people and so many people deal with guilt and shame around food. You know, so I just like to tell people, you know, I say it at every immersion, I just want you to get rid of guilt and shame because it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's the culture's fault. It's the food industry's fault that's been exploiting your reward system. It's the diet industry's fault because they haven't been able to tell you the truth that it's, you know, that, that eating the right way, your body will naturally lose weight and you'll never have to regain it again. So it's not, I always encourage them, it's not your fault. I want you to get rid of guilt and shame. And I want you to just step into a place of being hopeful. I always encourage them with this quote from Maya Angelou that says, I did then what I knew how to do, but now that I know better, I do better. And so it's, uh, it, it frees you up to say, you know what? I was just doing my best back then, what the culture told me to do. But now that I'm learning something new, I'm just going to decide to make different choices. And it's really just about winning today. It's about showing up today and making the best choice possible today. Not thinking about, you know, I have to do this for the rest of my life. You just win today. And if you win today, you'll be, have some momentum to carry in tomorrow. It's also not about perfectionism. It's not about being perfect because none of us are perfect. It's about just making the next best choice. And if we happen to make a choice that's not great, as we're working through the process of learning to do better, it's okay. We just make a better next choice. We don't let those choices that may have not been the best or were influenced by other things, stress being one of them, to derail a process, a journey of becoming healthier. And so that's the most important first step in developing a healthy lifestyle. It's just developing a healthy mindset, which is also just developing a healthier relationship with yourself, believing in yourself, believing that you can do it, believing that you are a good person, and stepping into the opportunity that's ahead of you with some hope, because there is so much hope. Um, healthcare doesn't inspire people with hope. You know, we are taught and we hear from our instructors oftentimes, you know, we'll tell people that's the worst case I've ever seen. It's never going to get better. This is, the, this is where you're going to go, because doctors don't know either. We're just doing what we're taught. Um, but infusing some hope. I wrote a book called Disease Reversal Hope, which is 36 stories of people reversing disease for that purpose, to just give people seeds of hope that, listen, if you step in, there's, there's so much opportunity to just get better and feel better. So that's where we start. Then the next step, the most important next step, is just eat more fruits and vegetables and whole foods. Don't have to be perfect, but every single serving that you add to your day improves the health of your body, it improves the health of your soul, uh, your, your cells and your soul. Um, there's actually some very interesting research around fruit and vegetable intake and um, well-being, well-being indices. And they find that, you know, the, that when people add, I'm just taking a little detour here since I said soul, when people add um, eight to 10 servings of fruits and vegetables to their diet every day, it has the same impact on their well-being as going from unemployed to fully employed. I mean, transformational in just the way that they perceive themselves by eating fruits and vegetables. So adding more and adding, you know, looking to, for other places to add to push out the unhealthy choices really will set you free. Uh, the one caveat is sometimes when you're fighting a, a life-threatening disease, you really do have to fight with every bite. And then you need to just dial in and say, every bite really matters now because my life is at risk. And that's the only way to reverse these, some of these diseases is truly to fight with any bite. But if you're not in that condition, progressively adding you know, and looking to improve, continuous improvement, your diet through more fruits and vegetables will make a huge difference. And then finally, I'll just summarize the stress piece because we could talk for two hours a week about stress. 
Um, you know, so much uh, of stress is really just the first step, taking a pause and practicing mindfulness. You know, uh, one, two, three, four minutes of mindfulness every day is a, is a really easy first step to just pull back, take some breaths, put some perspective on life. That's the easiest place to start. There are all kinds of apps from Headspace to others where you can start that process. And really what you're doing is you're just driving a wedge into the sleep cycle. Uh, I'm sorry, the stress cycle. So we have, you know, trigger, we have reaction. And we're just driving a wedge of mindfulness right in between trigger and reaction to just ask a simple que question, why am I feeling this way? And to pause and take some breaths and then over time it disrupts the cycle and you can regain some control. So that's the first easiest step. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. I, I love that you start with mindset first because um, I've heard a lot of people who you know focus on lifestyle medicine and we immediately want to help people and fix people's problems. So we say, do this, do this, do this, um, change your diet, sleep more. But the, the mindset of being able to actually do it, be hopeful, release guilt of anything. Um, I mean, the diet industry, the, the pharmaceutical industry, all of these, these things in the capitalist society don't make money off of uh, whole foods or you stressing less or sleeping more. So um, all of the advertisements have been targeted to reduce all of those things. So... Um, we were talking about stress management and sleeping well. Something that I'm I'm interested in as well is uh, your plantrition project that I would love to chat about. And I know that you are launching the Plantrition University. So can you explain what your vision is for the Plantrition University and also what is the Plantrition Project? Yeah, so we started the Plantrition Project um, based on my experience and recognizing that it took me so many years to try and unpack this whole, everything that we've just been talking about. And then it took me, you know, additionally extra time to figure out how do I really come alongside of my patients uh, and help them change, you know, not just giving them a general recommendation, but actually coming alongside of them as a physician, as a coach, and empowering them and walking the journey with them of life transformation through health choices. Uh, so we started a conference in 2013, and uh, the conference was successful. We wrapped it around a not-for-profit called the Plantrition Project with a goal of empowering, equipping, inspiring, and empowering um, healthcare providers around the world with the information they need, the support, the community um, to, uh, to assist their patients in making healthier choices and beginning and begin transforming healthcare, integrating this into the healthcare system. I saw a study um, not too long ago. They uh, surveyed medical school students in their first year and found that about 80% of med, med school students believed that nutrition was important in their, just as they were matriculating into their first year. At the end of year two, the number was zero. And so not only are medical school, stu school students not getting educated, you know, on average 19 hours of nutrition, which is really nothing about nutrition that we really need to know, we're like de-educating them. We're stripping away the idea that food and nutrition and lifestyle are really that important. So, you know, we started with our original vision, the Plantrition Project, of educating healthcare providers. But what we found is that there's a process of, like, unlearning and relearning that takes time. And so we wanted to kind of uh, go back to the original route and come alongside healthcare professional students around the world and give them the opportunity to learn in parallel to their current educational program. So we created a platform called Plantrition University, which will be a learning opportunity, um, both from the content that we've done over the last 10 years with the Plantrition Project, through uh, dedicated uh, courses that we'll be creating, a mentorship platform, and a community to come alongside healthcare professional students, whether it's dental, medical, nursing, speech th uh, therapy, PTOT, 
physicians to come alongside of them and give them a free learning platform to begin engaging in this education and hopefully overcome that de-education process in the beginning. So we're launching that this fall. It's free. It's, uh, you can find information um, on plantritionproject.org. All you have to do is be a, a health professional student, undergraduate, graduate school, um, residency, fellowship, and you can access the platform for free. Uh, we'll be building into that platform. There already is a community. There's information. We'll be building more programs, more educational um, channels, and we'll be building in mentorship opportunities for the next generation because I really believe it's your generation, Amanda, medical school students and residents and healthcare professional students that are going to usher in the next era of lifestyle medicine, which will be based on the value of the health of the individual. And so I want to do everything I can to um, empower and equip your generation. You know, I always see it like we talk about regenerative agriculture, that what we're doing now, myself and my colleagues in our generation, we're just cleaning up the soil in the field. We're getting rid of rocks. We're, we're uh, pulling out logs and weeds, trying to regenerate the soil so that we can give it to you to plant seeds that will bring a harvest that's beneficial for our world. So that is our vision for Plantrition University. I would love for anybody that's listening to this, that's a healthcare professional student, to join us. It's free. We're going to be there to support you. And if anybody wants to support that vision, you know, there's financial opportunities to do so too. We we want to reach, I want to personally reach 100,000 healthcare professional students in the next three to four years because that has tremendous impact globally. So I'm really excited about that and uh, appreciate your support of that, Amanda. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for, for doing the hard work for us because m removing the rocks and changing the soil is not the best part about farming. <laughs> so I really appreciate you doing the hard work for us and really leading the way. And it's so important to inspire people to now even just believe in lifestyle medicine. That is that study that you mentioned. I knew that like nutrition, education and medical school is horrible coming off of med school. Um, but I didn't even realize that it like really just reverses people's belief in it. That is that's crazy. Um, and then something one thing we had mentioned, um, which I, f I forgot to ask earlier on, but a lot of these disease processes are caused by inflammation. And we hear the word inflammation a lot, um, especially if we're kind of dialed into the like social media healthcare space or even just lifestyle medicine space. Can you explain to us like what is inflammation and why does it cause so many diseases? Yeah, absolutely. And we first have to understand that, you know, inflammation is not inherently bad. Inflammation is a body system that's there to, you know, react to foreign invaders and fight off foreign invaders, viruses, bacteria. It's there to regenerate and fix and repair injuries. And so our inflammatory system is a normal system. What's abnormal are the things that are, that are activating that system on a daily basis. And so it's, it's you know, what we're doing with our unhealthy food choices, uh, with per persistent stress, even with exposure to environmental toxins, we're just continuously activating our inflammatory system. We're creating a perpetual cycle of injury and inflammation with no repair and healing, and then a, um, a kind of down cycle of our inflammatory system because people are eating 2,000 pounds of food every year, bite by bite. And most of the food that people are eating is inflammatory. You know, 60% or so of everybody's diet is ultra-processed food. Every single bite of ultra-processed food triggers inflammation within two to four hours. It's measurable. We can measure TNF-alpha. We can measure HSCRP. We can measure NF kappa beta levels, we can see that in two to four hours, people become inflamed. Not only their bodies, but their brains become inflamed. There was an interventional trial where they fed people, they measured inflammatory levels, they also measured depression and social disconnectedness. Two to four hours, measurable inflammatory levels, TNF-alpha. Two to four hours, depression, social disconnectedness. And so we are continuously 
breakfast, lunch, dinner, 10 a.m. snack, 3 p.m. snack, after dinner snack, inflaming our bodies, injuring tissue, causing inflammation, and we're just stuck in a cycle of continuous injury and inflammation with no healing, recovery, and the only way to do that, one, is stop injuring your body. You know, if you're hitting your thumb with a hammer and it hurts, you have to put the hammer down. Same thing, you know, we're injuring our bodies with our fork, spoon, and fingers, and so we have to change what's on the end of our fork, spoon, and fingers. And that's the only way initially to stop the injury, but then we have to uh, look at what we need to give our bodies in order to start the healing process. And that is plants filled with phytochemicals and antioxidants, minerals, fiber to feed our microbiome. Um, it is at least a period of time where we are not ramping up our cortisol system because that also drives inflammation and disruption of the microbiome, which drives infl inflammation. So we have to give a cessation of peace in the midst of the storm with mindfulness. We have to get sleep at night. Our body recovers at nighttime between, and this is bad for all of us that were in medicine, <laughs> you know, between 11 and 5 a.m. or 6 a.m., your body has a natural cycle of regenerative healing. Growth, hormone spikes, prolactin, everything recovers overnight. And if we're not sleeping, we miss the recovery cycle and, our oppor and the opportunity to overcome the, the injury. And our body recovers through exercise. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's removing the injury and improving opportunities for healing by adding in the lifestyle factors and the nutrients that our body needs to heal and overcome the damage from inflammation. Thank you for that very clear um, explanation about inflammation. And lastly, we ask all of our guests to finish the following sentence. The future is blank. Oh, the future is bright. The future is hope-filled because of people like you, Amanda, and the work you're doing. The future is better than we might think. Uh, the future is filled with possibility and potential. Uh, the future is, um, I really think we're looking at an opportunity for uh, a kind of a regeneration and a revival in healing and healthcare as we start to learn and unpack uh, the information that um, your generation will be empowering patients with and infusing into healthcare. So even though we may look around and things look dire and bleak, I believe like, you know, it's the, it's the soil where seeds have been planted and you look at it and nothing's growing, but we're right on the verge of like germination. We're right on the verge of sprouts bursting through the soil. And I, I really believe, and that's why I do this work, that um, we are going to see uh, incredible things in the future. It's not without challenges. It's not without hard work and a fight. But I, I believe, and I choose to believe, in a hope-filled and bright future. Dr. Stoll, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, I really, really appreciate this conversation because... I mean, chronic diseases are increasing, mental health crisis is, is worse than it ever has been, but this conversation is so hopeful and you bring so much hope and have really spearheaded um, a trajectory that we, we can follow. And I really, really appreciate that because you have done the hard work for our generation of taking the rocks out of the, the dirt and we can help um, plant some seeds so that that will have the germination and the sprouting of, of health and revitalization. So I really appreciate all the work that you've done. And thank you for taking time and, and spending that with me to, this morning to, to chat about what you've done. Thank you, Amanda. It has been a great honor. I'm so happy to have met you and uh, I'm, I'm here to support all of the amazing work that you're doing. Thank you so much. We want to give a special shout out and thanks to Dr. David Pewter for his support in the production of this podcast, and Trent Jones for the music and who makes these podcasts sound amazing. And we want to thank Matthew Fleming for his podcast artwork. The production of this podcast wouldn't be possible without them.